CMMS Radio talks about all things CMMS, computerized maintenance management software, focused on maintenance management. It's the people, the process, and the culture that make your CMMS journey a success. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Today, we're talking with Basant Singhatwadia. He is Director of Customer Success and Strategy at Facilio. That's F. A C I L I O Facilio, where they're delivering a single pane of glass for facilities management. We're discussing searching for the right CMMS. A bunch of other stuff's going to come up. Basant, welcome to CMMS Radio. Thank you for having me, Greg. It is a pleasure. And we were just visiting a little bit. We've been trading emails, and some of the team helped coordinate this for us and get on schedule. So, I'm excited. The first thing I want to ask you about is you just came off of a conference and this was FMI. Uh, That was the majority of this week. We're doing this on a Friday. What was happening at that conference and what did you hear from people like attendees or other people about CMMS, computerized maintenance management software? Any common themes? Yeah. um, So yeah, FMI, I think it's, it's a great conference uh, uh, from a supermarket point of view. It's like uh, you've got the who's and who's of the supermarket over there and uh, everybody's trying to solve problems around the facilities management space. And one of the big themes, Greg, that uh, that came out uh, at the conference was, so the AIM Act was just ratified. And so usually EPA tries to do it when the FMI conference starts that, they would drop those bombs, like any action suits or anything that happens. And compliance was a big talk about uh, uh, from a from a from an EPA point of view, like uh, refrigerant handling. How do you deal with compliance? All the regulations that have changed. So just just to talk about like previously, EPA mandated fifty pounds or more. The systems that hold fifty pounds or more were the ones that. That, that were required uh, to be documented from a compliance point of view. They've reduced that limit to 15 pounds. So think about a, a lot more industries comes into play, like not only the supermarket, but now convenience industry comes into play. And so there was a big talk around it. Uh, uh, CMMS, as always, is the linchpin on the facilities management side of things. It's, it's, everything revolves around CMMS, but this piece... Uh, became very critical and crucial because the AIM Act just got ratified. And so there was a lot of talk about it. Uh, uh, and and at Facilio, we have come up with a solution that, that that really caters to the proposed AIM Act and now the ratified AIM Act, basically. And we had a lot of traction on that front. It's interesting because you know, in this this big, bad world of maintenance, you can attack it from several different angles. You hear almost every story. You hear about people leveraging their platforms for all different manner of things. And I recently did a post. Every now and then I'll do a post where I say, hey, nobody cares about your product. Nobody cares about your features. And what I really mean by that is it's the customer problem. So here you present a really interesting and often overlooked or maybe even misunderstood concept or driver behind why and how somebody can leverage their CMMS platform. It's acting as a historian. It enables all these other things, but you're talking about specificity in what you're focusing on, why you're at that show, how it connects to compliance. So I just, I always find this fascinating because customers out there, they're confused. They have so many choices. There's so many solutions and I like them to get to know who they could potentially talk to and maybe work with. Right. So one thing that I always want to talk about is why do facilities managers change or switch their CMMS platforms in your view, in your experience? Yeah. And I think so. It's, it's so I've been uh, in this industry for two de- two decades. Uh, I worked on a lot of facets of uh, facility management. So be it work order management side of it, the CMMS side of things, uh, uh, energy management, remote monitoring, uh, compliance side of things, mobile workforce management side of things. And uh, usually um, 
customers change the solution that they use because they're not getting the right kind of service uh, from a from a point of view of that a lot of companies would stop listening to their concerns i always believe greg that uh, customer like there are a lot of pain points that customers talks about and what has happened in the industry is that there is this products department that sits in an organization that makes a call on what is the right thing to do and what is not the right thing to do and uh-huh. and usually they overlook customers concerns and so uh simple things like hey this button needs to be here this button should be over here not over here a uh, product team really don't think in that way oh it's okay like hey, there's a button you go and press it somewhere but the location of the button how how easily you can access it like those simple little things are overlooked and i think that's where when customers starts feeling that the the vendors are not listening to to their concerns is when they start thinking about moving in my opinion that's the foremost thing that i have seen in the industry that the customers would move switch from one solution onto another and hence the on the cmms side too yeah and I, and you know for for me when i ask these questions and when i'm thinking about this i'm leaning back on some of my experiences all the different stories i've heard the times i've been at conferences and people are focusing on different aspects of this but you you make a good point where listening to your clients getting their feedback and then figuring out all right how many of these are consistent enough that we could deliver something that's going to make the actual impact so we're over as vendors saying all right we want to maintain our typical workflows maybe we have a very easy to use system and again i'm not making it about the product or the features but more so about understanding how this work gets done and then in fairness to all the vendors out there right whether it's facilio or someone else you get all this client feedback and then you have to figure out from a product perspective in product management and otherwise does this make sense can we do this without kind of switching from being a lion to being a leopard right you can't change your spots so to speak um just having a little fun with that the whole point is there's challenges on both sides so first you got to listen to your clients is what i'm hearing from you and you have to try to deliver that and then there's something hidden in there like for me i'm thinking well why do you need that why does it need to be there and i'm always thinking it comes back to everyone that's using it mm-hmm. they're they're getting stuck on certain aspects of how the solution works and that's where you have to start to understand how can we improve for the majority of our clients cuz you can't satisfy everyone so i'm big on this idea of who is the real deal who's doing it right who's really listening to their clients like you said and you are really you know heading up customer success so you get to hear all the stories and all the things is there a general process or or bit of information that you provide each and every one of your clients so that they understand when and how and to whom they should reach out to get guidance on actually adopting the system using the system yeah and so i think uh, the it's it's a it's a loaded one and so one of the things that uh, and it all starts from when you are implementing it for your customer and so i think uh, uh the problem arise when vendors dictate this is how it needs to be done rather than listening to the customer and so when you mm. when you start bad things just go down south more quickly and so the process that we follow greg uh, is more about sitting with the stakeholders so when 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 we are implementing it for our customers we would sit with every stakeholder that's there in the organization so you talk about a cmms I mean think about the number of stakeholders that are there there is the store aspect to it there is the store manager mm-hmm. who needs to use uh, the application to create a work order then there is the facility managers who are basically overlooking all aspect of it there is vendors there is internal technicians you got accounting team uh, you got the c suite and sustainability is another big aspect of it now these days like hey am i sustainable whatever practices that you are doing and so 
So if you don't have all those people sitting in a room, and this is more the the way we do it is we try to do it face to face, where we have got stakeholders sitting in a room and we talk about what they need. And yeah. and you're right, Miss. Like like you cannot give everything away, but you also need to listen and understand and how you think you can deliver the solution that will meet their need, but also keep your integrity of the product. And if you're not, it's a, it's a fine line to uh, to walk upon. But as as a person who has worked on products, engineering, uh, implementation, sales, pre-sales side of things, uh, I can understand like how how you need to do it. You need to talk in terms of what what their needs are, but also once you understand it, feed it to your engineering and the products team is to, hey, this is what it means. This is what the customer is meaning. And this is how we would do it. So so usually the, the, the initial process of, hey, this is what you need. It all needs to be documented very properly. All those stakeholders that have talked about it, we would document it very well. And then we'll get it signed by them because it's important that, hey, this is what you said and this is what we understood. And then yeah. that's fed to the implementation team and they implement it. So once you go live, so before you go live, the same stakeholders that that were at the start of the project would user acceptance test the implementation. And then you go live with the solution. So basically what you have promised and what is the output is the same people validating that output that they've signed a document mm. upon, a business requirements document. So that's the the start of the project and the implementation. Now, once you go into the support side of things, uh, I don't believe an email or a phone number giving it to the customer and, hey, call these people and they will take care of you. And so what we usually do from a customer success point of view, we'll have a customer liaison, uh, a person which is... So, so, the, so the beautiful aspect of it is the person is not the customer success from the point of view of talking good only. It's more about he understands or she understands the product as it is implemented for the customer. So when mm. a customer is ra- raising an issue, the customer success liaison is, is the first point of contact that they are also seeing those issues and, and, and tackle those issues accordingly. Some of the things can be user education. Some of the things can be really issues. And so, so we always want to be it as a closed loop process rather than just open-ended stuff. And, and that's where customers realize a lot of value out of this whole process. Miss, you were quite right when you said at the start, hey, features, and everybody has got all these features. It's all about how you go about and deliver a solution and then maintain and manage and, and 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 look after your customers is what makes the difference in my opinion i like it because it it's got a lot of shades of the kind of things that that i like to look for and you know some people might say well greg you should be asking tougher questions like wait a minute you got to look behind what these answers you know this dialogue really shows us so if you have a liaison in place that quite likely i'm assuming and you can clarify for me but they they have a comprehensive understanding of maybe what the clients are really doing and then the goal is we know what we have we know how it works but we want to know what you're doing how you're doing it so that we can get as close to that because i i actually personally believe that you know if you can get very close to that perfection is really tough to achieve then they can be involved and guide CS, customer success, CX, I should say, I suppose, uh-huh. where they're involved. And I like that you have that intermediary. The only thing I'm concerned about there is um, like overall workload. So a lot of people, when they're talking to me, they're they're saying, hey, um, you know, well, how big is that department? And I think there's a lot of ways to do it. Sometimes you can do it with a smaller department that can cover a large footprint, but that liaison is a critical component. One thing that interests me is when you were at FMI and we're talking a little bit earlier in this conversation, we're talking about like grocery stores and then you're talking about convenience stores. So 
we've got like a different magnitude of facility and not just with compliance, but when it comes to how they work and your mobile functionality, are there in this, I, I know it's more like product and feature, but from the mobile perspective, is it an actual app? And then are there different levels within it so that a technician or a vendor can use it in one way, a manager or even a GM of all these convenience stores or maybe a series of grocery stores can interact differently from the mobile device? Absolutely. And so I think uh, from an from an application point of view, it's like uh, when we talk about why you would choose a CMS, uh, uh, there are a few uh, salient things that one needs to be looking at. And one of them is the, the mobile side of things. Miss Everybody is on the move. People are not at their desk. And being able to have a mobile application that can cater to these different stakeholders is quite important. And so, like, uh, the mobile applications has to be roles and resource-based. So a technician just needs to know hey, these are the things that I need to work for today. And these are the list of issues that I have to I have to handle in the chronological order as it is sent to me because uh, the mobile workforce management aspect of it also plays into it where if I've got 10 technicians and I've got 100 work orders to be done, which is the one that needs to be done? Like from the, from the point of view of uh, route optimization, all that stuff is, is quite important. And so... Uh, so from a mobile point of view, uh, it's important when you are clicking on a work order and you are en route, you should be knowing, hey, what's the address of this? When I click on a button, it takes me to Google Maps and drive me there rather than uh, I have to figure out a route to go there. And so the application should be able to guide you. To so from a, te- from a technician, from a, from a point of view of people who are boots on the ground, uh, the app needs to cater to their needs, not about like high level stuff about KPIs and all that stuff. Now, having said that, C Suite is also always on the move. And so, uh, so if we are expecting them to be sitting on a computer and looking at a dashboard, it's not going to work out. So, so the way it needs to work out is that whatever you have your dashboards on your, on your, on, on your desktop applications, how can it be molded? onto the mobile side of things, where we can present that picture on a mobile phone, things that require attention. And so Mm. like just from a compliance point of view, like what is the most important thing that requires attention? Hey, the most important thing is my systems that are not repaired and are coming within a 30-day window because EPA mandates you to fix something in a 30-day window. Now that something is, is something that's, that's actionable that somebody needs to know higher up in the organization because every day, if you don't fix it after the 30 day limit, that's $60,000 of fines that, uh, that, that can, that can, that can accrue to you. And so I think that's, those are the kinds of things that how do you present that information in a way that uh, rather than presenting it as a number, can you present it as a dollar amount? Because the dollar amount really makes a lot of difference. And so, mm-hmm. Uh, the the application needs to have those capabilities where you can uh, talk about the impact of the issue rather than how many of those are happening across your enterprise. And so being able to depict it on the mobile side of things is, is quite important. Now, people use Android, people use iOS. So your app should be able to be downloadable from both kinds of operating system. And I think that's something that one should look for when they are looking for a CMMS solution, in my opinion. Uh, the other bit that you talked about touched upon uh, the store part of it. So like uh, the same app is also being used by the store people. What is their, what is their, they don't need to be on a maintenance application. They only need to come on the maintenance application when they have an issue. So mm-hmm. from their point of view, an easy button to create a work order. So, Hey, I click on this and it pre-populates everything that needs to be pre-populated. And I just write down, take a picture and then press a button and it creates a work order, goes to the relevant people. So uh, interesting. I, I I wanted to just interject there where, you know, so you're, you're on your mobile device or maybe even it is at a workstation or point of sale 
you know, there, there's a little area where someone can go in. So when we look at convenience stores in particular, well, it could be grocery stores as well. They've got plenty to do already, but they see an issue. They have an issue. They need a way to literally just boom, send it in mm-hmm. and keep doing what they're doing. And the idea of pre-populating, uh, what I like about it is when I click to put in a work order, cause I've got a problem here, I've got a light bulb out there. I've got an asset that's failing. Maybe I have a, a cooler system that's giving me some indication that there's a problem with the temperature maintenance. It's not maintaining temperature and mm-hmm. I need to send something to somebody. When you talk about pre-populating, when I click that button, it already says everything about my location. Where am I? And then you can pick a service type or a generalization of a service type that somebody else can then manage and maybe even connect it to an asset in question. Is that kind of how it works? Absolutely. That's that's how it is. So asset in question is you can just, if it is barcode tagged, you can just read the barcode and it will populate everything related to an asset. So when you are creating issues for that particular asset, you already have a list of problem types. You already have what are the issues that can happen on that type of an equipment. You can select from a list or you can always say, hey, there is another problem that I don't see in the problem type and then attach a picture to that issue. And and it's easy to do it on a mobile phone, basically. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of people now, I mean, we 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 know a lot about this idea of generational uh, changes. We've got the gap when it comes to skilled trades and people seeing things in certain ways. Now they see them in new ways. And, you know, a lot of the, the new generation, this is where they live anyway. So it's probably going to be second nature to them. Do you find that clients themselves, when you're dealing with them and talking to them, are not as aware of how well they could leverage their technology because there's a resistance? Do you ever see, do you guys ever deal with a resistance to adopting the use of the system? And if so, can you give me an example of how you've helped a client? You don't have to name who they are, overcome that with their team? Yes. And so I think a uh, recent example, I think uh, we, when we started our discussions with the stakeholders, uh, uh, we got in uh, two people from the store and one of the person was very adept in using the desktop application. Another one was using the mobile phone to create those work orders. And so you, you try to get those varied voices uh, in when you are talking about all these implementation details. And uh, and so yeah, we, we started talking about and say, hey, have you ever used the mobile? Oh, no, I don't do it because I'm comfortable doing it the way it is. And change is always a difficulty. Now, change is difficult when it seems difficult. So how do you help people people cross that chasm? And, and I think the, the important thing is, in my opinion, is training materials and how easy the training materials are. Because usually what happens is, in the past, what has happened is you will have a, a, a PDF document, a 10-page PDF document that somebody has to, people don't have time to do those things. And can you have a quick video snippet of training that, hey, this is what happened, this is what it looks like, you click here, you click here, you click here, and hey, boom, here is the work order that gets created. So I'll, so, so this was the past. Now, when we went live with the application and we did an analysis of uh, all the store managers and what they were using to create work orders, each and every one was using mobile phones to create their work orders because it was very easy, very intuitive, because we created snippets of videos for them to look at where they can easily easily, easily look at and, and, and create those work orders. The challenge is, in my opinion, is that it seems overwhelming when you are used to doing things in one way and you have to do it in another way. But if you can make it digestible, easy to understand, uh, people accept technology, in my opinion. It's, it's not that they are, they are averse to using technology. It becomes a problematic where they don't know and they are shooting in the dark and things don't work out and then they would fall back to what they've been using in the past. So uh, that's 
how I see it as is, is how you can bridge the gap. Greg, the problem is means the users have got different levels of skill set. So you cannot mm. expect them to be tech savvy. And so how a vendor, how a company that's providing the solution is listening to that and providing a solution that is foolproof is, is the only way people are going to accept technology, in my opinion. It means if you look at it 20 years back, people are all writing on a piece of paper. We have come a long way. And it's it's an evolution as we move along. And how easy we can make it uh, is how people are going to accept it, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and you know, one, one of the things we have to all kind of consider is that as much as we're trying to get it right, sometimes we get close because to get it absolutely perfect is a challenge. So having the right kind of materials, the right availability for someone to reach out and get help, maybe coming up with strategies such as, well, here we have a client and they've got a, a group that's really resistant. Let's talk to them. Let's find out why. And all of a sudden through those conversations, maybe it's the liaison you talked about that's in between customer success and the frontline customer, so to speak. And they find out, well, they're doing this, this, and this because that's what they're used to. And they don't know how to do these two things. And then you, you train them up by themselves, not just lumping them in, not just giving them digital uh, learning materials. You can, you can help them turn the corner because oftentimes I think resistance comes from a lack of understanding and at the same time, the disruption to their existing process or processes, because especially when we talk about maintenance people and maybe even vendors of the client, they have their way that has been successful for them. Good, bad, or indifferent. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're doing what they do. And then you're going to add this extra layer or into the fold. I wanted to switch in. So on these concepts of like scalability, adaptability, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about deployment timelines. When, when you when you see the the true adoption take place at a client, regardless of the size of the client, you're, you're actually seeing them thrive. Do do you find that there are a couple of particular areas of the solution that they they just resist moving to because they don't want to do all that again? For example, let me give you a better example. So you've got a client. They're leveraging work orders regularly, constantly. People are submitting them. People are closing them out. They're going out to the vendors. Vendors are interacting and closing them out. But you're noticing these clients aren't doing anything with assets and equipment. They're not putting them in. They're not posting work orders against those assets. And then you're reaching out to clients saying, hey, we noticed you're not using this. It's part of what you already have. And... We want to help you turn that corner. Do you ever get resistance on something like that? Not that they're arguing, but they're they're just kind of good with what they've done so far and they just can't turn that corner. I hope that kind of makes sense. Absolutely. So I'm seeing the opposite of it. So I think, uh, uh, so, so like the example that you talked about, like the asset part of it and uh, the... The facility managers, the, the administration wants people to use assets in the work order records because the more granular the data is, the more better the decision making ability is. So, uh, so, so, so how do you help them out? And so like if they're used to a process of putting in, not putting in an asset record in there when they are working on a work order, the easiest way is technology. So. So, so what I believe in is people, process, and systems. And so you can have, you, you, you need to have every aspect of this being worked upon. So is the system capable enough to allow adding an asset? So, so like, like there are some kinds of assets that are, are costlier and you want to make sure that they are part of your work order records. And so for those categories of assets, and the customer, most of the customers have put in asset tags and they're all there. It's that uh, people are choosing not to put in an asset record because the past work order system allowed doing them that way. 
how do you bring a change in the behavior and it's the technology side of things when from a workflow point of view like when you are starting work on a work order you can prompt the technician hey you are working on it there is a barcode sitting there can you please scan it i will not allow you to start working on a thing if you cannot select the asset and then you populate the asset in the work order simple easy mm. uh, once you have done that then there is no change that the to the process basically it's just a a a a prompt that comes out which is easy enough because you are at the asset and you can do that activity and with technology mobile phones you can scan qr codes you can scan barcodes and it's it's easy to do it now the effect of that change and it it was not a lot of disruption because it's it's very intuitive to do that uh but the effect of it is that you have got better repair versus replace decisions you can have better depreciation policies that you can put in such that you know that hey this is asset is due for capital replacement you can take decisions that uh, this make and model and this make and model this make and model breaks a lot more because i know now because this asset breaks but this other asset which is from a different manufacturer doesn't break because the work order is still the same it's it's the inclusion of that element is something that is quite important and so a lot of customers want that to happen now in my opinion and so they're saying hey we had a bad process we didn't put in those things hey how can we start incorporating those elements in there and so uh when you got a a tick so the problem with uh older um, cmms is like the technology side of things and it's change is difficult because the tech stack greg is very old so when mm. so when you ask this change of hey can i put in a prompt basically you are talking about going to the product team product team goes to the engineering team uh it's a 6 to 12 months time frame of before it gets turned around and so so that's one other thing that i would advise customers to look for technologies that have that have the ability to turn around these kinds of feature sets and functionality quickly and one of the concepts that's talked about in the in the in the market right now is a low code no code technique and so mm. can i without writing a single line of code achieve what you're talking about can i insert in the workflow of getting work done and put in this element in there and it's easy to do but you have you need to have the technology right kind of technology that infrastructure to be able to do that and i think that's that's going to make a lot of difference now miss we sit in a in a world where miss like at at facilio we believe that this this facilities management space is at an inflection point so what i mean by the inflection point is that uh, right now if you look at it the facility manager needs are solved by a lot of siloed solutions and mm-hmm. uh, but the the time has come for sort of a change because this change is necessitated as it is no longer a want but a need of the industry because if you look at you you mentioned uh, your technician workforce is shrinking not many people want to come in the straight now uh, but the amount of work is always increasing we need more efficiencies and those can only come when you're talking about systems solving these these needs are tightly integrated with each other and so uh, has got the ability to adapt has got ability to make changes at uh, at a faster pace than what has happened in the past and and it's like if i look at like crm space means if you look at salesforce uh, what it did 20 years back to the crm space it basically revolutionized that space in my opinion and facilities management space is still not there it's still in a stone age place in my opinion based on every solution that solves it needs is very siloed they don't talk with each other and i think that has to change greg if if we have to solve this problem and make this uh, the the industry more efficient and 
and and more attractive for people to come in, in my opinion. It's what I hear often, and I don't just go by what I hear. Sometimes it's about observing what you're really seeing out there. Uh, these deficits, this skilled trades gap, it's actually in all of industry, not just maintenance, not just facilities, not just manufacturing, but it is literally everywhere. And I don't want to talk about you know all the different industries, but even the industry that you're talking about service. So like in in today's episode, we're we're quite focused on multi-site retail. We're talking about grocery stores, we're talking about convenience stores. You know, maybe it's a gas station and convenience store combination and they've got, you know, 200 locations, 2000 locations. We got to keep chirping about that. Now, I said I wanted to ask a little bit about deployment. Um, mm -hmm. one, one of the questions you'll tend to get from clients is, well, how long does deployment take? And personally, I think there's the general answer and then there's the real answer. So I'd like to hear just a little bit about your approach to deploying the solution. And what I'm talking about is, for me, when I think of deploying a solution, I wanna know everything about your company. What is it called? Where is it located? What's the HQ? And I wanna put all that in the system. Now I wanna see all the different sites. Now I wanna see all the different buildings or locations themselves. I wanna break them down further. And I wanna set up things like service types, work order, workflows, and I want them to start loading in assets in a phased approach. Mm -hmm. Do you have something similar or have I missed something? Uh, I, yeah, I think, <laughs> you, hey, so big challenge in the industry. And I think uh, if I were to give you a very theoretical answer, oh, I can do everything very quickly. Sure. Uh, oh, uh, my implementation is going to take two months and others are taking 12 months and 18 months and whatever it is. Um, the, 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 the challenge in the implementation, even if, 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 if my implementation team can do it day and night and turn it around in two or three months time frame, think about a thousand store chain, a 5,000 store chain. The change is, 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 is so enormous. It means changing from one system to another. And so implementation cycles, the, the, the time it takes also needs to take into effect how many stakeholders it is affecting. And, and how do you go about taking care of that? And so, uh, so our approach is, is a phased wise approach, crawl, walk, and run approach, uh, Greg. And so, 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 so if you look at a multi-site retail, it's like uh, uh, a lot of things are defined at a client level where you'll say, hey, this is what the process should look like when you work on a work order, start, stop, all that stuff uh, is... I pause work order, like all that process is, is a similar process. Now you can always induce changes based on your site type or your location where you are. And that's the discussion that we have when we sit with the stakeholders. But assume that vanilla workflow processes are there and, and you implement those workflow processes for a client. The, the thing that's important is that you cannot bring about a change, like it's not a digital signal, a zero or a one. And what you need to do is, is you need to have a phased wise approach and uh, you implement the solution, but then you go live with just a bare minimum of stores to go with. Uh, you choose depending on complexity, depending on region or whatever it is, like a parameter that you tie and you say, hey, these are the first 10 set of stores that needs to go live on the solution. And you will iron out a lot of kinks by doing that. Uh, because whatever you implement in the real world, when you roll it out, it's different. And you need to cater to that input, iterate upon it, and then go live with 100, then go live with 500, then go live with 1,000. And so that's a very time consuming affair in my opinion. And so if I'm not honest to my customer and I say, hey, uh, I can implement in, in, in two months time frame the solution that you're looking for because it's easy to implement all this technology, easy to implement. Involving I, stakeholders, I, making sure that they are they, 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 they understand how it needs to be done is a very different ballgame altogether. When 
you're in a position to tell your potential client or existing client a very accurate thing about the endeavor that they're on, that they're in, how this journey is likely to unfold. And you eliminate the, uh, one of my friends, he says, uh, the rainbows and kittens, right? You, you say that it's not that. Now, you don't have to make it doom and gloom, but mm-hmm. they need that reality because you're talking about an actionable item that's relative to their own overall corporate health, trickle mm-hmm. down and then out, trickle out to their clientele. So I like that. I think vendors need to be willing to tell the most accurate story about what's going to happen. And sometimes people on the front lines at a lot of these companies, I'm generalizing here so that they can kind of just get these ideas in their head. They're afraid to do that because they're going to lose the sale or they're going to scare the client. And I'm over here and people are like, Greg, you can't be talking about this. (laughs) Scare the client. You tell them the truth because you know what? I think they, meaning all the different clients and people that we talk to, the people that we say, no, we wouldn't be the, good, the, the best fit for you, but we really want you to thrive and succeed. Let us know if it doesn't work with those other companies. We'll be here, but the best to you because we can't do that yet. That is refreshing. That is real and allows people to keep moving. And this is all about this big, bad industry that we all play in. We all have passions for it. I know you have a history in the space. So first and foremost, I want to thank you for spending all this time talking to us a little bit about Facilio and what you're doing and how you're doing it. It's not the whole story. So we're going to be getting more around this story. But in consideration of your time, I'd like to switch you to the fun question segment for all first time CMMS radio guests. Are you ready? Yes, I am. First fun question is, what is your favorite music? Goodness. <laughs> a lot of people would not be able to correlate to it. So, like, my favorite music is Hindi music uh, okay. from the 70s and the 80s, basically. So, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a great singer over there in India by the name of Kishore Kumar and uh, uh, Asha Bhosle. And uh, they have sung, sung some great songs. Melodious, very good, but I know the audience over here may not be able to correlate to it, but that's the type of music that I like. And that is all that matters. There's no wrong answers with any of these fun questions, and they're supposed to be fun and allow people to kind of get to know you because you're part of the culture at your organization as well, but you're also a person. People find it interesting. Number two, what is your favorite sport or hobby? And if it's a sport, it doesn't have to be one that you play. It could be one you like to watch and support. Yes. So my favorite sport is F1. So it's like that's something that I am a big fan of F1 and I follow the F1 sport all over year round, basically. And it's very interesting <clears throat> to watch <clears throat> people look at speed. People don't look at what does it go into getting that car on the ground and achieving those kind of speed, speed. There is so much of science behind when do you replace a tire? When do you not replace a tire? Do you want to replace with an intermediate or you want to replace with like the kinds of decisions that you have to take? Split second decisions can make or break. Uh, what what What's the outcome? What's the What's, who is the winner and who is not. And I think that's very fascinating to me, in my opinion. I've been a, a big fan of Ferrari. Uh, they're not doing that great <laughs> for the last many years. But that's fine. It's like you still need to be a fan of what you are a fan of. And yeah. and I hope that they do, do good in future. But the sport in itself is is amazing. Like the The type of preparation that gets in and and, and 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 the science that's used behind that is is, yeah. is mind boggling for me. I tend to agree because when I look at it and I listen to what you're talking about, your you know it connects to everything if you really look at it in that way and how much goes into it. And there's somebody driving a Formula One race car, whether it's a Ferrari or otherwise, and what goes into that. And then there's an entire team 
And then there's a team behind the team. And then there's organizations that make all this stuff. And then there's certainly facilities involved. The place that you're at watching it, the venue. I mean, it's fascinating, right? It's fascinating. So number three. Now, this is the big one in the fun question segment. No Uh wrong answers here. What is your philosophy, opinion, approach, anything you have to say about work-life balance? Yes, so that's that's a great question. And so I think uh, one of the things that my grandfather used to always talk about is uh, work is worship. And so uh, so when you are working, when you are working on a thing, put in your 200%. Uh, but I think the important bit is when do you want to segregate from it? That's important too, because if you are just working on for 20 hours, 16 hours, 15 hours a day, your efficiency decreases. And I think you learn over the course of time, Greg. It's not that, miss, a, a, a young me, I could put in 16 hours and think that, hey, I am, I'm, 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 I'm doing 16 hours. And yeah, that's great. And I think I'm producing a lot of output. But if I look in hindsight, those 16 hours that I put in, did I really put in at 100%? That's not true. And so work is worship. But also you need to make sure that 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 you are taking time to defocus such that you can come out stronger again when you get on to working on on on, on that thing. And that's that's what I have believed in. Uh, I've always I always tell my kids um, there is no alternative to hard work. Uh, uh, intelligence everybody has, but how do you use that intelligence comes by working hard in my opinion. Nice, 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 nice. And you know, no wrong answers because we get these insights, we get these ideas, we get these concepts. Somebody hears it and goes, I don't agree with that. Or somebody else hears with that. Oh, I've never heard that before. I want to think about that a little bit. And that's all it really is. So first of all, for everybody out there, uh, check out Facilio. It's F I C I L I O.com. And if you want to get in touch with F-A-C-I-L-I-O, F-A-C-I-L-I-O. Yes. Dot, dot com. Dot com, yeah. Yeah. And you can find Basant on LinkedIn. And if anybody needs any help getting in touch with them, go ahead and hit me up or get in touch with him. Basant, really appreciate you joining me on CMMS Radio today. This was fun. Hey, Greg, uh, I really appreciate you uh, having me on the on the podcast. Uh, This was great. This was fun. Did you find this episode helpful? Please send us some feedback, suggest a topic, or ask a question. Reach out to CMMS Radio if you need a co-pilot on your CMMS project. Visit cmmsradio.com and use the What's On Your Mind link. Thank you for tuning in to CMMS Radio, your resource for all things CMMS from selection to implementation to help you make better choices, learn from industry experts, and have a successful CMMS journey.